Welcome back, everyone. We are now on session eight on our series on discipleship. We have been looking into the 10 qualities a person should have to grow from being a believer to becoming a disciple. But before that, let's take a quick review of what we have learned so far. First, we talked about loving God above all else. Second, it's that we have to have an extraordinary love for other people. Third was about having the heart of a servant. Then we learned about being sensitive and submitted to the Holy Spirit during our fourth session. The fifth characteristic that we learned is a disciple is to be obedient to the authority of the Word, which we all know is the Bible. Now, sixth session was all about how a disciple can live a morally pure life. Then the seventh was about a disciple should be committed to spreading the gospel by boldly sharing it to everyone that he knows. So today we're going to talk about being part of a biblical community. Now, what is a biblical community and why do we need to be part of one? Let's just start by saying that a biblical community is very much similar to our natural family. I want you to think about that for a second. What you actually have is two kinds of family. You have your natural or biological family, then you have your spiritual family, both of which are related by blood. One by the blood of your ancestors and the other by the blood of Christ. Now, let me ask you a question. How is your relationship with your spiritual family right now? Think about it. Do you have a family of believers around you that you're living life together with? There is a reason why the Bible calls a group of believers a family. With God as our Father and we as brothers and sisters in God's family, we are to walk together hand in hand to grow towards Christ's likeness. When Jesus was on this earth, he was teaching the value of being in some kind of community of believers. He even had this group of 12 apostles that traveled with him everywhere. In Acts chapter 2, verses 43 to 47, it says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. What we see here is what a biblical community should look like. They study the Word of God together, discussing what they have learned, and praying for each other. They even dined together. They see to it that the needs of the believers were met. Worshipping and praising God with sincere hearts. This is the result of believers adopting the qualities of a disciple into their lifestyle. These people don't gather together just for the sake of obligation. These people gather together because they enjoy each other's fellowship. It's where they break bread and pray for each other. Their love for each other is genuine as shown by their generosity in sharing their possessions. That is what a biblical community looks like then, and that is how it should look like today. Can we still have that kind of community here in church? It's actually possible, but way too difficult. Why do I say that? Because most Christians today would rather, you know, be by themselves than to gather with others. They would rather deal with their own problems rather than helping other people with theirs. You may see people gather around with a smile and chatting with each other in church, but chances are you will only see that on Sundays. And once they leave the church, it disappears until they meet again next Sunday. But the Acts Church was far from being that way. The Acts Church met every day. In Acts 2 verse 46, every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. So how can we have an Acts Church lifestyle? How can we be excited to gather together that we are not satisfied with only meeting on Sundays? For us to have a genuine community, there has to be unity. Now, here are some action steps that we need to develop in us for us to grow as disciples who are united together in a biblical community. Let's look, at, let's look into each one of them. First one is that we need to learn to value other people. In other words, when you get into a room of people that have different personalities, you learn to value people that are different from yourself. You do not shun them away or avoid them. 
you learn to overcome some of the obstacles that sometimes separate people. The Acts Church would not be what it was if each person sees himself higher or lower than the other people. They look beyond the differences of nationality, wealth, and status, and they valued each other as members of God's family. In Romans 12.10, it says, Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. How can we learn to value each other? We need to look beyond what is the visible and look into what matters the most, the love of Christ in all believers. Jesus died for everyone. He did not die for a certain nationality or ethnicity. No amount of wealth, no amount of knowledge, no amount of talent that you have will increase or decrease God's view of your value. God's value and love for each one of us is the same. We need to value all people the same way Jesus values them. How do we do that? By looking past the differences between the two of you. There should not be any boundaries that causes God's family to be separated that way. The only thing that should be common to us as believers is that we are all children of God. And that alone should cause us to value each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. The Acts Church looked beyond the differences of their nationality with each other, their wealth, their state status, and they valued each other as members of God's family. Jesus doesn't care how much money you have, or what you wear, or where you live. You are His beloved child, His delight, His treasure. You want to know how much Jesus values you? He already loved you before you were even born. In Psalm 139 verse 14, it says that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. He values you so much that He even died for you. In Galatians 3.28, it says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's how much He values each of His children. And if I want to be His disciple, I'll learn to value His children in the same way. That doesn't mean that I have to agree with other people in everything. But it means I love them enough to look beyond the differences and to focus on what is more important, and that is loving each other the way God loves each one of us. You need to learn to value all people the same way Jesus values them. Now, do you see everyone in church valuable now? If you do, then there is no sense in ignoring them any further. Reach out and show them that they are as valuable in your sight as your very own children. And as you reach out to them, don't put on a mask. Be yourself, because the next action step is that we need to learn to be authentic with other people. How we behave in church is how we should behave outside of church. You know what's the biggest turn off that unbelievers have towards Christians? That Christians are the biggest hypocrites because they don't walk the talk. You know why people tend to behave differently depending on where they are and who they are with? They want to be accepted by the crowd. And to be accepted by the crowd, they act like the crowd. The people has a word for people who behave like that, and it's a word that is familiar to us. Hypocrite. We say one thing and do another. We present an identity but hide who we really are. Jesus used this word to expose the truth about those self-righteous religious leaders like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were proud of their external righteousness, but inside of them, it's totally different. That's why Jesus told them, you hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That's in Matthew 15, 7 to 8. We belong to God and we belong to each other. Authenticity is the path to emotional, spiritual, and relational healing. But we hide who we really are and present a false identity because if the truth of how we live as Christians is revealed, then we will become the laughing stock of the whole church. We may sing inspirational songs, say the right religious words, and smile, but we're rude to our spouses, harsh with our kids, negligent in caring for people, and dishonest at work. You know, I've even seen couples with their kids yelling at each other in the church parking lot, but as soon as the car door opens, they are the picture of a happy family. Now, I'm not suggesting that you deal with your hurt and anger before coming to church. The church doesn't exist for perfect people but for those who are humble enough to admit they desperately need the love and power of God. James tells us, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. 
The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. That's in James 5, verse 16. Listen, trusting people with the things we buried in our hearts is one of the most challenging steps in becoming Christ's disciple, but it's essential to our spiritual growth. Sadly, it's not that way in many churches and small groups. Instead of being authentic, we hide. And in many creative ways, we avoid telling the truth. Listen, all of us are sinners. The question isn't whether or not we sin, but what we do with our sin. Will we choose to reveal this weakness in our biblical community so that they can help us? Or will we hide it from each other and try to hide it from God? When Adam and Eve sinned, they covered themselves in fig leaves and tried to hide their shame. Did you think the creator of the universe couldn't see under the leaves? Do we think that the same creator can't see beneath our mask? Remove the mask and show everyone who you really are. A repentant sinner that is not afraid to be authentic because by doing so, we help each other. And if we learn to value each other and trust each other enough to be authentic with each other, it will open a door for us to be committed to be accountable to each other. Everybody does better when someone's watching them. Proverbs 27 verse 17 says, Iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. This verse shows the interaction between two faithful friends who are seeking the improvement of one another by the sharpening of an iron stone with an iron sharpener. When we're involved in each other's lives and we become authentic to each other, we will not be afraid to encourage each other to do more for God. We listen when they share their dreams, and then we help them construct biblical plans to reach those dreams. And when they struggle with a bad attitude or a habitual sin or a troubled relationship, we provide the support and accountability. We need someone to help us deal with our weaknesses and boldly confront the sin in our lives. In Ecclesiastes 4, 9-12, it says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. I think this verse speaks for itself in saying that two, at least two, are better than one, especially as we travel through this road towards becoming a disciple, things are going to be hard and probably harder because you are now committed to be more Christ-like and Satan doesn't like it one bit. When we fall, we fall alone. But when we have a mentor or a co-disciple that will be committed to walk with us towards our goal, when we fall down, he picks us up. When he falls down, we pick them up. And we commit to love each other by holding each other accountable to, of our sins and our weaknesses. We can never reach Christ-likeness alone. Well, probably will, but it's going to take a long time and take a lot of work on your part. Why not divide the load? Invite a friend into your life and together walk, to, walk along the road that God has prepared for the two of you and help each other out. Things will become much, much easier. The problem is, most people who attend church would rather just be believers and not disciples. Believers avoid accountability rather than welcome it. So they continue to struggle alone with sin and doubts, and we can't blame them. Maybe the person that needs to be blamed is us. Why us? Listen, does the person feel safe to be himself and share his life in your M group? Or will he see that list of sins which he shared to your group? printed on the church bulletin or flashed on screen as one of the prayer items. Your group should be an environment for people to feel safe, valued, and loved. Maybe we can ask ourselves this question. If you are not one of the leader of your small group, would you love your group? Do you feel loved and accepted in your group? Do you feel safe in that group? You see, people in a biblical community should show that they care. Jesus said in Matthew 25:40. Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. You need to show that you care, and that's the next action step. You should learn to care for one another. But how can we do that? How can we show authentic love and care for one another when the church population is so big 
and we don't know everyone who attends church with us. That's true. That is why we are doing it through the M groups. That's what we call our small groups ministry in our church. When you start to have a biblical community in the form of a smaller unit of believers, then everyone within that group will be taken care of. Now, again, I'm not saying that you don't need to attend Sunday worship, but to efficiently grow to be a disciple, you need to attend both. Church service to worship God and M group to follow God. The church alone cannot minister and sh show care to all of us. We need to gather as small groups of brothers and sisters who can care for each other because of their close relationship with each other. In Matthew 18 verse 20, it says, For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. When something happens to someone in the small group, the members of that small group community take over and they start caring for each other. They visit each other at the hospital. They come over and bring food to each other. They pray for each other when they get sick. They help counsel each other when things are going wrong or becoming challenging. And they celebrate each other's victories and they weep with each other's troubles. Now, in comparing between a believer and a disciple, a believer would rather just attend on Sundays. Tell him to add some ministries, he would not. Tell him to join a small group, he would not. Because his focus is, I'm a believer, I'm only required, quote and unquote, required to attend Sunday service, and then I'm free to do what I want to do with my life the rest of the week. But disciples do things differently. They understand the things that are needed for one to grow, to become an effective discipler. And what they are committed to is to keep on meeting with other disciples so that they can strengthen each other and move forward together. And being on Sunday service is not enough. You've heard in the Acts passage that we read a while ago that the Acts church, which is the first church, they meet every day. I mean, we only see each other most probably once a week. And now that we are on lockdown and we see each other in a Zoom screen, I think it's not the same, but in the Acts church, they can't, they can't wait until they see each other the next day. And that is a true commitment of how a disciple should be. Now, let me ask you this. Are you part of a biblical community? Because if not, then you are missing out on a lot of blessings that is in store for you. When you are part of a thriving biblical community, you're far more likely to grow into a dynamic disciple of Jesus Christ. Going to church on Sunday morning is important, but connecting with other disciples during the week is even more important. Interactions with others adds depth to your understanding and specifics to your application of the Word of God. When you are part of a vibrant biblical community, which we call M groups, worship on Sunday morning becomes more meaningful because you're listening more intently and you're more in tune with the Spirit. So guys, no more excuses, no more delays. If you don't have a small group yet, I encourage you to find one today. Find a group that's committed to turning believers into disciples and dive in with all you've got. Now, to summarize what we have learned today, we need to remember that to have a genuine community, there should be unity. And that starts with valuing each other. No one is more important than the other. Everyone is precious to each other just as we are precious in God's eyes. And as we value each other as a disciple of Christ, we become authentic or real to each other because we have nothing to hide. Everyone makes mistakes. But as disciples, we hold each other accountable to make those mistakes into a learning lesson for us to grow in Christ. Now, before we end in prayer, I would like you to think about these questions. The first one, I want you to read Acts 2 verses 43 to 47. What do you imagine it would be like to live in such a community? Second, why are some reasons why people are afraid of authenticity? How about you? What is holding you back from being honest and open to your group? Third, have you ever asked someone to hold you accountable? If so, how did it help you? If not, then why not? Number four, if you had to be rushed to the hospital, who would know? Who would take care of your needs for you? Or on the side, other side of the coin, who would you do these things for? Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for teaching us today, teaching us that we should be a, join a biblical community for us to grow as you want us to grow towards Christ's likeness. Lord, may we not take this opportunity of gathering together in fellowship for granted. Lord, we know that we cannot go out physically because of the ongoing virus. But praise God, Lord, that you even provided us with the technology to still see each other and hear each other th through uh, computer softwares. Lord, we ask that you continue to pre protect each one of us from the virus. And Lord, if it's according to your will, please take it away from us. Well, Lord, we ask that you continue to impute in us, Lord, the prodding of the Holy Spirit that we should change to be more of a disciple than just a believer, that we should strive to be mentored and to mentor others. And this is very important to you, and we should hold it important as well. We pray this in the mighty name of Christ. Amen and amen.